Now today I'm going to share something uh, personal and uh, so I'm going to share something personal and I want you to understand the motivation behind it. Sometimes uh, when you're a preacher you get the great opportunity to get up and speak before people. Uh, that's not an opportunity for you as a minister to air your personal grievances. And if you've been in a church where that's done, it's not a pleasant experience for anyone. Uh, it's not a place where you get up and you expose people that have hurt you or disappointed you or let you down. It's not the place for that. All right? And so one of the things you have to be very careful of when you minister the Word of God is that that's never what's coming out of your heart because you don't want to sit under that and uh, it's not healthy for the church and it's not healthy for the minister. And, uh, but this morning, I do want to share something of a personal nature. And uh, after this service, this is what I don't need. Okay? This is what I don't need. Oh, Steve, oh, Steve, oh, oh, oh. I don't need you to encourage me. <laughs> All right? I'm not preaching this so that afterwards you encourage me and say, you know, oh, but, oh, oh, oh. I'm not looking for that this morning. Okay? So I'm not looking for your encouragement. I'm not angry about this. I'm not hurting about this. Uh, I've made sure I've processed this well. And it's now in the rearview mirror. All right? I've moved on. Life has moved on. But what I learn in it, I want to share because I think it's very beneficial and helpful. So I'm not sharing this morning because I'm angry at someone or I'm bitter about something or I want to get back at someone or I want to have my say and I'm too scared to do it face to face. So I'm going to use up here to do it. I'm not, it's not anything like that, but I want to share what I learn out of it. All right, so I want to share what I learned because what I learned has been incredibly powerful and helpful for me in my life. Recently, um, I had someone say something very nasty about me on a personal basis. Have you ever had anyone say something nasty about you personally? No, no, no one here? No one knows what that's like? Now, I don't mind on a professional basis because... You know, I'm a pastor and everyone's got an opinion on what a pastor should do and what a pastor should not do and what I'm not doing well and what I'm doing. Look, if I wanted to be popular, I'd just go and sell ice cream. I'd just go sell ice cream. Everyone loves you guys sells ice cream. But if you want to be a pastor, part of that comes with this thing of that people are going to critique your performance. And I'm okay with that. I understand it. I get it. It looks so easy. If you were pastoring, the church would be 10,000 people and revival would break out. I get it. I understand it. I've sat in the seat that you've sat in. I've had the same opinions. It's not as easy as what it looks. Now, I will say this. I'm just going to say this as a by, by the way. I do think that one of the challenges the church is going to face is that there's going to be a lot of young people that don't want to be senior ministers because of the criticism that they continually cop. We're already starting to see in most denominations now a lot of people who refuse to be senior ministers. They're happy to go on a team, happy to go on a staff, but they don't want to take the position of a senior minister and a lot of it's to do with the criticism and stress they receive. And I think that's going to be a big problem for the church. I reckon we should have a rule in church. You know what I reckon the rule should be? For every minute that you talk and criticise and critique my performance, you should spend an equal minute praying for me. I reckon that would just be a great thing, wouldn't it? Every time you do that, you just spend another minute just praying for me because I'm not going to always get it right and I'm, and I'm okay with that and I understand I'm not perfect. So I'm good with all that. I'm happy about that because I'm never going to be the perfect pastor. But it'd be great if you could pray for me. And if you pray for me, who knows, I might even get better. <laughs> might even do that series that you really want or what you think I should do or whatever. You might be amazed what God might do and then you can take all credit for it because you prayed. So while someone can critique my performance, and I don't have an issue with that, when it comes to personal stuff, it hits a little bit different. And recently I had someone say something quite nasty. And, uh, you know, it hurt me. I'll be honest, it hurt me. It hurt me. And I felt misunderstood. Now I'm not going to say what they said because I just don't feel the grace upon you. <laughs> But what they said was pretty unkind and couldn't be further from the truth and I felt misunderstood. And I think I understand why they said it. I'm going to share a little bit about it. I'm not going to say exactly what they said. But I'm actually a shy person by nature. Uh, I don't stand on a stage and preach because I get something out of it. 
Um, by nature, I don't need to stand up and do this. I'm actually a shy person. Uh, I was saying at the men's camp, I grew up in a town of 48 people from zero to 10, 48 people. So imagine Tarnagala, who's been to Tarnagala? Divided by three, that's the town I grew up in. Very small town, very uh, just regional centre, not many people around. I went to a primary school with about 36 kids. Big school. Big school. And I'm fairly shy by nature. I'm just the way I'm wired, it's, it's who I am. Uh, I'm really tall. Well, I am tall, not really tall. I don't know. I'm somewhere in the tall factor. I'll just put it that way. You know, I love it now because it's really great. When I go to the airport or whatever, I can see over the top of a queue and I can see how far we've got to go. And my wife will say, how big's the queue? Oh, yeah, it's about, you know, 10 to 20 deep. Jen's got no idea. I like being tall now, but when I was growing up, I hated it. I hated being tall because I stood out. And, uh, you know, it's really funny. There's, there's photos of me as a kid and I was bent over like, I looked like an old man. All I needed was a cane. And I realized that why I did it was because I didn't want to stand out. I didn't want to be different. I just wanted to fit in. And uh, it, it's real funny. I had my, my mum and dad over recently and we were talking and we, we were having a bit of a laugh because when I was growing up, because I was tall but also shy, uh, I, I didn't like talking to people. I know that sounds terrible, but I was just really shy. And my mum had on a couple of occasions, because I was so tall and because I was so shy and wouldn't talk to people, my mum had on occasions people say to her, um, your son, is he mentally all there? <laughs> That's how shy I was, because I would just clam up and go, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I was just so shy. And um, it's quite funny, I laugh about it now, but you know, anyway. I'm okay with who I am. If you're asking me about a birthday party, I mean, who wants a birthday party? Who's with me on that? Who wants to be the center of attention? Not me. I don't want a birthday party. That's the worst idea you could possibly have. So I understand who I am. Now, I don't necessarily like that side of me. I wish I was a little bit more outgoing and wasn't so shy. But I am who I am. I'm made in the image of God. God's created me a unique way, and I'm okay with it. And, you know, and I understand that in life that sometimes people can misunderstand who you are. People can misunderstand uh, the way in which you're wired, in the way in which you do life, and actually misread things. And as this was going on, this person said something. I didn't react to it, but it really hurt me. It really hurt my heart because I thought, That's, they so totally misunderstand me. And... I was just processing, and as I was thinking about it, and if you're like me, when those things get in, they kind of play in your mind a bit. And so I started, all this stuff was going on. And I felt a passage of scripture just drop into my heart. And I want to use this passage of scripture and what I've learned from this passage of scripture on how to forgive people that hurt us. Unforgiveness is one of the worst things you can have in your life. It's a horrible thing. It's a horrible thing. But it's a thing which a lot of the time we can struggle with. And as I was just, I don't know, I just felt this passage of scripture just drop into my heart. It's a very simple passage of scripture. You all probably know it if you've been a Christian for more than a little bit of time. And it's just simply this. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. It's one of been one of the most profound and beautiful blessings in the last six months to journey through this passage and use this passage to weave in forgiveness. I just found an incredible thing. And maybe you're here this morning and maybe you've been misunderstood. Maybe people have misread you. 
Maybe you feel like that's not who I am or that's not what I'm about. And someone's labelled you. And sometimes when people label us, what can tend to happen is we, we get the perception, is that how everyone sees me? Is that what everyone thinks about me? Is that, what, is that how the world sees me? And we can shrink back into ourselves. And this morning, if you're in one of those positions where someone's labelled you, said something about you, uh, spoken something over your life, and you felt yourself go back into your shell, I'm believing this morning that we're going to break something in the Spirit of God, which is going to bring breakthrough to you, that you are going to go back to who you are, who you are in Christ, what you're called to be, that that feeling of being misunderstood is going to go. Now, as I said at the start, I'm not preaching this because I'm processing this. I'm preaching this today because I'm at the other end and I'm believing this morning that God's going to bring you to the other end and you're going to be able to walk through this and you're going to take whatever that thing was, you're just going to go, gone. It's gone. I'm not not letting that just stick around any longer. All right, so you're ready this morning. You're still with me this morning. In Luke 11, 1 to 4, it says, It came to pass that as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, one of the disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John also taught his disciples. Now, we're not sure in this passage of Scripture uh, whether Jesus was praying with the disciples or whether Jesus was praying alone and the disciples were observing. But we see that the disciples say, hey, we want you to teach us how to pray as John taught his disciples, all right? Now, we do know this, uh, that, you know, when I think of John the Baptist, how many of you, when you think of John the Baptist, you think of a solitary kind of guy, don't you? Think of a guy kind of living out in the wilderness, but he actually did have disciples. The word disciple just means to learn in the Greek. So he had people that came that wanted to learn off him. And so they came and they followed him we know that at least two of John's disciples later became uh, disciples of Jesus. In fact, there's a really funny, uh, real, I find scripture really funny. I laugh at scripture all the time because we just read it and go, oh yeah. But if you think, if you saw it in real life, I think it would be pretty amusing. And one of these uh, funny ones is in John 1, 35. It says this, the next day Jesus, John was standing, this is John the Baptist, with two of his disciples. And he looked at Jesus as he walked and he said, behold, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this and they followed Jesus. You imagine John. Here he is, he's walking along and he's got these disciples and they're following him. And he says, behold the Lamb of God. And then two of your disciples just go, whoop, okay, we're following this guy now, see ya. Just imagine what that would be like. Would that not be weird? Hey, I'm following you, John, you're the guy. Oh, hang on, behold the Lamb of God. Oh, okay, we're going to this dress. See, John? That's what happens. And so we know that at least two of them have been taught by John how to pray. All right, John had taught them how to pray. We have no record of what, how John taught them to pray, but we do know that he obviously taught them to pray. And so now these other disciples who hadn't been with John are saying to Jesus, Jesus, teach us to pray like John taught his disciples to pray because we want to know how we should pray. Very, very good thing to ask. And so then we have this, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive those, our debtors, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Now, I remember when I was first saved. I got saved when I was 17, walked into a church, just had a radical encounter with Jesus, and I, I was a part of an incredible young adults ministry, and we would have these incredible prayer meetings. And we would go into these prayer meetings, and there would be people praying. And I just, like, I was, I loved it and perplexed by it at the same time. Because, you know, when you first get saved, you've got no idea what you're doing. I, I took my Bible, and my Bible had all those book tabs in it because I didn't know where any of the books were. Do you remember those days? Yeah, because you couldn't work out where any of the books were. And I'd be like, they'd say, look at Leviticus. I'd be like, Leviticus? Like, flick, flick, flick. Anyway, and so I'd go there and I'd stand with my Bible, and we'd, we'd do this prayer. And I'd listen to people pray, and I'd be like, man. Their lingo is so good. Listen to their lingo. Listen to the way it just all kind of, it's, it's almost poetic. Their prayers are like this and their prayers are like that. Have you ever felt uncomfortable in a prayer meeting because you feel like everyone else prays so much more eloquent, so much more connected, so much more better than you? Anyone with me? Okay. And it was like that environment. And I went in there and I was like, oh, no, no, no. I was too scared to pray. And I love the the fact that when Jesus teaches his disciples to pray, you notice that it's incredibly simple, 
It's incredibly brief. It's not highfalutin words. It's actually very, very simple. And you know, there's a simplicity in your prayer life. I want to encourage you in your prayer life that when you come, and sometimes when we come together as a church and we pray together, sometimes people think, I've got to have these great words and this great thing to put together to impress everyone. So that you're all impressed by my great prayers. Do you know, you don't have to impress anyone with your prayers. It's a simplicity. In fact, Jesus says uh, to his disciples, he says, hey, it's not through the babbling of many words. It's not through eloquent prayers that you find the heart of God. It's through the simplicity of a pure heart. And sometimes when you go into a prayer meeting, I want to encourage you, maybe you're not, you don't feel courageous in prayer meetings. Hey, if you just pray a sentence that's pure from your heart, praise God. That's all you need to do. Oh, you're not convinced. Come on. That's all you need to do. Just be real. Be authentic. Be yourself. This is why I love the Lord's Prayer. Now, I'm going to look at this and how it helped me in actually walking through forgiveness. Are you ready? We're going to look through this through the eyes of forgiveness. I've never looked through it from the eyes of forgiveness before, but I just felt, as I said it, and as those words came out of my mouth, that something dropped in my heart, and God said, use it to walk through forgiveness. So we're going to do that this morning. So it's, the prayer starts off with our Father. Now, we read the word Father, and we just go, oh, yeah, cool, Father, God, Father, great, fantastic. You have to understand just, just how different this was for a Jew. This was not how they related to God. They didn't relate to God as Father at all. In fact, if you read John chapter 8, you'll find a very, very interesting, the whole chapter's an interesting chapter, but in the chapter, there's a problem, all right? The Pharisees say to Jesus, your witness is not valid. Uh, you have no witness, so therefore your testimony is not valid, all right? And Jesus says to them, I have the witness of my Father, all right? Later on, if you follow along, they say, well, where is your Father? All right? And he says, me and my father are one. He goes through his whole different things. But the truth will set you free. If you had known me, you would know my father. And they say this word, they say, no, we, our father is Abraham. All right? So they didn't see God as their father. And Jesus comes along and he says, no, no, God is your father. Now, when we talk about fatherhood today, I do understand we live in a world that's fallen and corrupted. And the image of fatherhood is not what it could be. But that's not who our father in heaven is. Our father in heaven is the father of all good things. The father of heavenly lights from all good things flow and every blessing comes and everything good in your life comes from. That's the father that we have in heaven. He's not like an earthly father despite whether he was good or bad. He is totally different, totally above it. He is perfect in each and every one of his ways. That's the father that we have together as believers he is perfect and so I love this that Jesus says we're to relate to him as father in Galatians 4 it says that he has given us the spirit in us which makes us cry out Abba father there's something inside of us that cries out to him to say hey I want to relate to you in that way that you are my father you're not distant you're not removed now here's a wonderful thing it says our father Sometimes when we're going through interpersonal conflicts with people, particularly other Christians, we forget that he's not just my father. Some of we, sometimes we treat him like he's just my father. Oh God, you got to get him. You got to get him, Lord, because he said this about me. And we act like he's my father, but no, Jesus says it's our father. And if he's our father, we're brothers and sisters. Now, I'm going to make a very controversial statement to anyone under the age of 25, but that's okay. We'll let it land where it may. My generation and the generations before had the worst cars in the world. I can remember when cars didn't have air conditioning as standard. It was an optional extra, whether you had air conditioning. Sometimes you had a window. You wound it down or you wound it up. That's, that was your air conditioning. Set of the traffic lights, fried, wound down a bit further, kept going. Hey, let me tell you this. We had vinyl seats. 
I mean, let me tell you this, vinyl seats, which you stick to in summer, and your leg kind of like you have to break your leg with surface tension off. We had seat belts that also acted as branding irons. The sun would burn on the seat belt, the metal seat belt, you'd pick it up, it'd fall on your leg and brand your leg and you'd be like, scarred for life. Our in-car entertainment was looking out the window for 12 hours on a trip. That was the only entertainment you had. We didn't have Taragos, we had three in the back. That was it. Sorry for the trauma I'm inflicting on some people. I used to have a sister called Linda. Now, I used to sit in the middle until I grew big gangly legs and then I got to sit on the side, which was fantastic. Because no one wants to sit in the middle seat when you've got three kids. The middle seat is the worst seat of all. There's nothing, you can't lean against anything, you can't do anything. And so my sister Linda would have to sit in, in the middle. And we'd be travelling along. And I would, I would do these most annoying things. She would say, Mum, Stephen's looking at me. I only had two choices, one way to look, either that way or that way. But apparently looking at her was the worst thing I could do. Why are you looking at me? My mum would have to put up with, you know, he's in my space. His leg is in my space. His leg's over, mum. Mum, look where his leg is. It's over in my space. Even worse. He touched me. He touched me. He touched me, mum. He just touched me. And I often think about my poor parents driving the car, having to listen to that for 12 hours. I mean, come on. I wonder if God sometimes feels like a parent sitting in the front seat, listening to the kids in all their immaturity, immaturity, because you don't do it when you're an adult, do you? When you're an adult, you don't go, oh, he touched, don't look at me. You don't do that. I hope you don't do that in the back of the car if you're traveling in the back of the car with others. I really hope you've gotten beyond that. But it's immaturity. And I just wonder if at times God just sits there and he's like, what are you guys doing back there? Can you just show a bit more immaturity? Can you just let go of some things? I wonder if God, you see, sometimes we see God and, and we, he's our father. And we're his kids. And we're at times we're going to display immaturity towards one another. But at times we've got to grow up and show a bit of maturity. It starts with him as our father. The second thing is this, is who is in heaven. See, whatever we're going through right now, our disputes, our tensions, our problems, our difficulties, let me tell you this. If one day we're going to end up in heaven. And you're going to be with some of those people that you don't like. You might get stuck with me. I'm telling you, we're going to end up in heaven. And when you get to heaven, you're not going to be going, oh, he said that about me and I was on earth. It's not going to matter. Some of the stuff that we get so upset about. Hey, heaven is my home. That's my destiny. That's where I'm going. Some of the stuff that we're going through, come on, we've got to just be the kind of people that can go, hey, I'm not going to take that to heart. That's not my destiny. I love what it says in 2 Corinthians. It says, for our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that outweighs them all. Some of the stuff we're going through, we can make it bigger than Ben-Hur. We can just let it go. We can make a conscious choice to let it Go. You're still with me this morning. It says, hallowed be your name. It's, a, it's a, kind of a strange word, hallowed, isn't it? It just really means consecrated. And one of the things when we go through conflict with people is this, is that sometimes we care more about our name than his. I, have, oh, I can't say that about me. It's my reputation. And that, that's, hey, what about his reputation? What about if in our interpersonal conflicts we actually think about his reputation and what it looks like for him, not what it looks like for us? 
See, sometimes we get bound up in the thought of, oh, what will people think about me? Uh, what will people say about me? Do you care more about that? Do you care more about your name or his? Anything that takes away from his name, I want no part of. If it's been nasty, if it's been controlling, if it's been manipulating, if it's fighting back, I want no part of it. Let me tell you this, fights amongst Christians or bad behaviour does not make his name glorified. What makes it glorified is when we act like he tells us to, we turn the other cheek, we act with compassion, we practice forgiveness and we allow his name to be lifted up. May your kingdom come. May your kingdom come. One of the things we always need to think about and process when we're going through conflict is this, is that we are very, very attuned to getting off track. His kingdom should be our first priority of our life. And one of the things that happens when we have a conflict with someone and we don't want to forgive is we come off track from what God actually wants us to be focused on. This is why Paul, when he writes to Timothy, says, no one, no one who's a soldier gets involved in civilian affairs. Don't get involved in things that are going to take you away from your purpose, what you're called and created for. And let me tell you this, if you have the attitude that, Lord, I want your kingdom to come and I'm not going to get off track, I am not going to allow myself to shrink back, I am not going to put myself out, I'm not going to be the hurt one, I'm not going to be the person that stands and goes, oh, oh, well, I'm going to give up and I won't do anything for anyone, I won't do anything. No, I'm going to keep seeking your kingdom, I'm going to keep chasing after you, I'm going to keep running after you, I'm not going to allow this to distract me or take me away from my purpose. It's all about his kingdom. Are you still with me this morning? Your will be done. Oh, <laughs> this is a funny one. Your will be done. Sometimes when I pray, I'm aware of something that I do. I seem to tell God a lot of the time what his will is. You should do this and do that, and that should happen, and then you should do that, and then do this and do that and do that and do this. But Lord, it's your will. It's your will. It's not my will, it's your will be done. And Lord, whatever you're doing in this circumstance, I'm not looking for my will, I'm looking for your will. What's your will in this? Lord, what do you want me to do? Lord, what is it that you're building in me? God, what is it that you're challenging in me? Lord, what is it that you're making in me? What are you changing in me? What are you taking dependence away from? What are you doing? Lord, what's your will in what you're doing in my life? Your will be done. Your will be done. And give us this daily bread. Give us this day our daily bread. The daily bread that you need around forgiveness is this. And it's a very simple one. Have you ever forgiven someone? And you go, that's it, I forgive them. Forgive them. Great, fantastic. And you wake up the next morning and you go, Oh, oh, I don't think I've forgiven them. Ever had that? Okay, just three of us, that's good. Three of us will meet afterwards, we'll do a little prayer session, we'll work it out together. Let me tell you, it's very, very normal. It's very, very normal. And what God wants to do in our lives is he wants to give you provision to forgive again today. That's the provision of God. I forgave him yesterday, but I'm going to wake up this morning. I feel the same. I feel that anger. I feel whatever. I feel resentment. Hey, Lord, help me right now to forgive them again. Give me the ability today to forgive, to be able to say, I forgive you. 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 See, Christians have this idea that you forgive once and then that's it, and you never feel anything ever again. No, it's walking in a way of forgiveness that you keep forgiving. Every time it comes up, you keep forgiving. You keep forgiving. You keep forgiving. You keep forgiving. He's going to provide for what you need each and every day. The daily bread is to be able to walk in forgiveness time and time and time and time and time and time again. He'll never give up. He'll never stop giving you. He wants to work in your life to help you to forgive. He has ongoing provision for you. Forgiveness can be a repeated act. Sometimes we think we want it like that, but sometimes you've got to keep repeating it, keep repeating it, keep repeating it. All right, now we're going to go, to, we're really going to have church now. 
we're really going to have church now. And forgive us our sins. Oh. Whenever you have a conflict with someone, it's amazing how you're so readily able to point out the sin in their life, but totally neglect yours. When I was going through this conflict and I came to this part of the scripture, I had to acknowledge something quite painful. That what this person has done to me, I've done to others. I've said nasty things about people. I've misread people. I haven't seen people's hearts. It's really great when other people do it. It's fantastic. Oh, it's easy to identify and say, oh, look at them and they're doing that and that's all wrong and that's all bad and that's all, they shouldn't do that, but what about me? Sometimes we're so busy pointing out the sins of others. Do you remember the story where Jesus says, there's a Pharisee and a tax collector. The Pharisee says, the Pharisee says, I thank you, God, but I'm not like any of those people. Do you know, we can have the same attitude. I thank you, God, I'm not like them. Huh. But we can be doing the same things. And as I began to process what this person had done to me, I began to think, God, who have I done this to? Because I'm going to ask you forgiveness for people that I've done this to. Because this isn't a one-way street. And when it goes on, it says, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Notice they're connected. The two things are connected. I'm going to get Joe back on the keys. Thanks, Joe. The two things are connected. If you don't forgive others, Jesus says this many times, neither will God forgive you. I reckon this is the most scary bit of scripture you read. This is scary. Because we all talk, Jesus has forgiven my sins. Read it. Every single time, it's a very interesting thing. Jesus says, and that's why we have the parable of the unforgiving debtor. I'll paraphrase this story for you. There's a guy who owes a lot to a king, can never repay it. He cries out to the king for mercy. He says, please forgive my debt. Please forgive me. And the king does it. And then he goes out and he finds someone who owes him just a little bit. And he throws him in jail. And the king hears about it. And Jesus concludes the story by saying this. This is how it will be for you if you refuse, refuse to forgive your brother from your heart. Powerful words. Powerful words. I'm telling you, these are scary words. In fact, in Luke, where it talks about the Lord's Prayer, this is how it ends. It says, For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly for if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Wow. Wow. It's a bit scary, isn't it? Does that worry you? Worries me. We can't afford to walk in unforgiveness. We can't afford to walk in bitterness. We can't afford to say, well, we're going to do that. And then we finish. And it says, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. When it comes to forgiveness, you have to understand this. The devil... The devil, who is very alive and very real, does not want God's forgiveness. He has no desire for the mercy of God. He has no desire for God to forgive him. He walks in unforgiveness. And the temptation that he wants to put in your life is to be exactly the same as him. Don't forgive. Hold on to your hurt. Hold on to your grudge. Let, just let that thing just sit there. Let it just stay there. Don't ever deal with it. You just, you've got every right in the world to hang on to what they said about you. Don't you dare ever forgive them. That's the temptation of the devil. The temptation of the devil is hang on to that hurt. Hang on to that offense. Don't forgive. Be like me. Be like me. Don't want, you don't, I don't want forgiveness. Neither should you. 
I'm all out of time. I've preached a message all over the place. But this is what we're going to do. If you... I'm going to get everyone to stand. Let's all stand. Why don't you just close your eyes. If you've got someone in your life... Well, maybe this morning as I've been speaking, there's someone you need to forgive. You need to forgive. Remember the words of Jesus. If you don't forgive them, <laughs> neither does he forgive you. I don't think you want that going on in your life. You don't want that happening in your life. I know sometimes we talk and we say, oh, you know, you need to go get counselling, you need to go get help and you need to do... And I'm, I'm a great advocate for that. But I'm also an advocate that sometimes we make forgiveness such a big deal that we make it almost impossible to forgive. But you can choose in a moment right now to forgive. You might need to process that. You might need to work, walk that out. You might need to see and get some help with that. But it doesn't mean that right now in this moment you can't choose to forgive. You can choose in this moment to forgive. And if God's prompting in your heart, if God's prompting in your heart that this morning you need to let go of something, you need to forgive, you need to move on. I just want you to just put your hands out in front of you this morning. I'm going to pray over you. I'm just going to believe the Spirit of God is here. The Spirit of God's here. Don't fight it. Don't fight it. Don't fight His Spirit. He's going to help you. You might feel that I can't do this. I can't do it in me. I can't do it in my own strength. And maybe you can't, but let me tell you this. The Spirit that's inside of you longs to do the will of God. And it's going to help you. our Father. I thank you that God, you are our Father. You love us. You care for us. Lord, you see our squabbles. You see all the things we do out of immaturity. But Lord, we're brothers and sisters. I thank you that Lord, you're in heaven. I thank you, Father. But Lord, the things we're going through in the light of eternity sometimes aren't that big. Help us to keep that perspective. Hallowed be your name. I thank you, Lord, that Lord in this is not a fight for my reputation or what I look like. But Lord, I want to make it about your name and who you are. And anything that sullies or tarnishes or brings disrepute to your name, Lord, I want to avoid. I thank you that, Lord, I thank you, Lord. Father, I just pray for every person that's struggling in that area. But, Lord, it's become about their reputation. It's become about who they are. It's become about what they look like. I pray, Father, that, Lord, today they will put aside that. But, Lord, that will be put aside today. That, Lord, there will be a change in their spirit, a change in their attitude. Help them to lay down themselves right now in the name of Jesus. Father, I thank you today. But it's about your kingdom. And I pray, Father, anything that's diverted us, that hurt which has diverted us from your kingdom purpose, from kingdom intention, but Lord, we will go back to what we're called to be. Lord, I pray today that, Lord, your will will be done. Not what we think should happen, but Lord, what you think should happen. Lord, we surrender to your will afresh. And give us our day, our daily bread. I pray, Father, that today, that Lord, when we don't feel that we can forgive, that Lord, we can believe that every day you're going to empower us by the Spirit of God to keep forgiving, to keep forgiving, to keep forgiving, to keep forgiving. Lord, forgive us for the things we've said, the things we've done to people. Lord, we have not been perfect. And Lord, it's very easy to spot the, the faults and the sins in others. 
but very hard to sometimes identify it in ourselves. But Lord, we stand before you this morning saying we're not innocent in this. Lord, we've done things to hurt others. And we repent of those things today. Lord, we forgive those that have hurt us, wounded us, said things about us. Because, Lord, we know what it's like in the light of being forgiven by you to forgive others. Because we can only represent you, our Father. Because you're our Father and you forgave us. And, Lord, what kind of children would we be if we didn't follow your example? And so, Lord, today we choose to forgive. Lord, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one who wants to entice us to stay wounded, to stay offended, to stay hurt, to stay broken. Lord, give us the courage to walk through an open door that you have for forgiveness for people. In Jesus' name.